Hi, I'm Tim Brunner with IFS Coatings. And I'm Mike Maxwell with Lorea Corp. We're bringing you a video today uh, about fluidized bed dip coating, the um, process itself and the equipment that is needed to support that process. Uh, fluidized bed dip coating was one of the first co powder coating techniques back in the 50s and 60s. And um, since then, there really hasn't been too much uh, put out there on it and the techniques and um, some of the science and engineering that go behind it. Uh, Mike here is a uh, longtime expert. I've used him. We've worked together on numerous projects and one of my go-to guys whenever we um, uh, need something designed properly. So Mike, I'm going to turn this over to you. And if you could just tell us in basic terms to start mm -hmm. off with, what is fluidized bed dip coating? And mm -hmm. can you break it down into a few basic principles and steps? And while you answer that, I'm going to play a clip of a process on the screen. Sure. Uh, well, fun, the most fundamental steps are, you know, clean your part, heat your part, and dip your part. Um, as you're uh, as you're seeing on the on the video here, you got a, a, a tank full of uh, fluidized powder uh, where the parts have been preheated, and then they're they're dipped in the in the powder until you uh, accumulate enough on there that you get a, a nice gel. And uh, you tap off the excess powder, and, and then you're on your way. In simplest terms, those are the fundamentals. It's, of, of course, a lot more complicated than that. And building a, a professional uh, powder coating system, whether it's manual or automated, takes a, a lot more work and detail. That's a good point, Mike. Now, what you're not seeing in this video is, is the preheat, uh, the parts are preheated in an oven, and then they're brought out, and you, you're seeing the, uh, the dipping and the, the raising of the part, knocking off the excess, but you're also not seeing the uh, post oven that it goes into um, that sometimes is, is required. Um, I'd also like to point out the fluidization level and the nice uh, steady uh, eruptions on the surface. Um, we're gonna talk about that later on, how to, to correct some of the problems when those get really big and, and offensive and, and problematic. Um, I, I will say this is, uh, I'm going to say nine out of 10 times, uh, this is not done with an automated lower rater. This is a uh, process is performed by uh, a, a, an operator reaching into an oven and pulling out a part and dipping it by hand and then putting it back in. Yeah, and uh, uh, when I when I work on designing and, and laying out these systems, that's a factor that we look at in defining the system is, is how are we going to do this dip process? Because, uh, it can be done in three basic ways. It's either a, a manual operation where you're dipping the parts by hand. Uh, you can do the opposite of what's shown in the video here. You can actually have a system that has a hydraulic lift table and lift the, the powder tank up to the parts so that the parts can stay on a, on a conveyor. Or you have an automated system where the parts come down off the conveyor and are lower aided into, uh, into, the, into the dip tank. Now, each one of those three different choices, either manual, uh, lift, or, or lower air, uh, each has its own technicalities. And uh, what you look at are things like throughput. With a manual operation, you're going to have a hard time making a million parts a year. Um, with, a, with an automated system, you can, you can approach a million parts a year easily. So you got to kind of look at the, the production requirements and what kind of speeds and stuff are needed to get you the throughput you want. Um, but those are some of those fundamental things we talk about strategically when we're trying to figure out what method we're going to work with for uh, uh, designing one of these systems, for sure. So what does fluidized bed dip coating equipment look like in terms of components and the support equipment that's needed to make this process go? Well, obviously the first piece of equipment is the tank itself. Uh, the tank is, is like a hopper. It's got an open top to it. Uh, there's a there's an air plenum at the bottom of the tank with a, a permeable membrane separating the two regions. You inject air to in the bottom of the tank to, uh, to fluidize the powder and, and make it nice and fluffy. Um, then from there, uh, uh, you, the other support equipment that's involved in, involves considerations for the type of conveyor. Um, there's there can be anything from you know your tapping mechanism to a, uh, a, a agitation mechanism. Uh, the of course a, a, a very important 
part of the, the design process is how you are supplying the air to the tank. Um, that can be done with compressed air for very small tanks. You don't really want to use compressed air on, on even medium sized or larger tanks. From there, you go to something like a, a compression blower uh, or a regenerative blower. There's different different fan performance curves. You need to understand how to analyze to do that. Uh, from the fan and the air system, you've also got considerations for whether or not you need to, to chill that air supply line or even heat it. Um, and then there's also the air piping itself where you know, there's certain components like checking pressure, checking flow, and some other things that you, you want to do so that you're making measurements of, of how the system is performing and so you know how to have you the proper airflow settings when you're when you're running productions in a professional system. Uh, in addition to that, you may need uh, automated uh, uh, powder supply pump with a level sensor. Uh, you may need temperature sensors to make sure that the, the powder itself isn't getting uh, isn't accumulating too much heat. Um, and then you can even have an automated system conveyor for the tanks themselves so that when you're running a high production line, you can you can quickly switch from from one tank color or one powder type to another without losing a lot of production time. Uh, there's actually a, a lot of different support equipment options for considering uh, designing a, a, a fluid bed dipping system. Great, great. Do you it sound like you have some strong opinions on uh, the use of house air versus when to move over to a uh, over to a blower? I I, I really do. Uh, I've seen. <laughs> A lot of the calls on my board have to do with with solving issues and solving problems with the way that the tanks are fluidizing. Uh, what what happens often is we see the uh, the the powder supply hoppers that are used for for spray guns get adapted from what people know. They adapt those to uh, to try and make the, the the fluid bed dipping tanks and. Uh, the principles are not the same. Those they don't they don't scale up the same. And so uh, I'll frequently see uh, I'll frequently see videos of, of what people are doing and, and see the the powder violently erupting like like a Hollywood movie with with the lava splashing all over the place. Um, and usually that's because the uh, they're they're applying compressed air um, or the wrong size uh, the wrong size blower, and they haven't balanced that airflow with the membrane choice that that they've got in place. Um, and really, the, the only way to fix that is to, is to to go in and 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 change those items and change those parts and pieces. Now, uh, for going back to compressed air, it is a good choice, but it's only a good choice if the air consumption of the tank is is less than than maybe 30 cfm. Uh, you know, the it, it, out in a shop, you've got uh, things like uh, like like air routers. Uh, an air router is a high con is a high consumption. Uh, tool out in, in, in shops and, and those things consume 25 to 30 CFM, but they also only run intermittently. Um, they're not running continuously for hours on end. Uh, I don't like to size uh, tanks to consume more air than that. Uh, and really, once you get anything above that size, it's just really an inappropriate choice because you can't, you can't balance the air and the pressure needed to get smooth fluidization. And so you end up with all of these all these artifacts and you end up chasing your tail, uh, doing a lot of different alternative things to try and iron that out. And that, that compressed air is usually uh, just the source of the problem. Yeah, and, and not to mention the um, cost of uh, running the compressor yeah, to, to that level. It's a huge cost. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah there's, there's places that I've seen that are that are running over 50 horsepower on an air compressor to run one large tank when that same job could be done with a five horse blower. Uh, and the, the, the cost of, of the energy there on a monthly basis, a yearly basis, I mean, that, that adds up quick. Yeah, you hear that a lot, you know, compressed air is expensive, but when you're, uh, when you're blowing 500 CFM of compressed air all day, every day, that's, that's when it's really expensive without a doubt. All right, Mike, can you give us um, a slam dunk example of when a fluidized bed dip coating process should be used? You know, one that checks off all the boxes and almost be impossible to do in any other coating process. 
Yeah, wire form weldment parts are a great example of that. Uh, refrigeration racks, dish racks, uh, face masks for sports equipment, shopping carts. Uh, there's a lot of point of point of purchase displays. Even uh, there's a lot of different examples in in our daily lives of, of wire form weldments that a lot of people don't even notice. And those are uh, those are parts that are fantastic for dip coating because uh, you can you can clean them and, and heat them easily. You can can dip them quickly and easily. Um, the parts like that also don't usually require a very thin film. Uh, dip coating is a process where you can put a lot of parts on powders very quickly. Um, I, and I just said that backwards. <laughs> where you can put a lot of powder on parts. Uh, putting the parts on the powder is not going to get you very far. But <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, when you uh, when you want to put a lot of powder on the parts quickly, dip coating is fantastic. And and that the, with wire forms, uh, if you're using an electrostatic sp spray method, it's hard to get a lot of powder on the parts. You, you, you get back ionization, and when you get back ionization, uh, that's a tough obstacle to overcome. It doesn't make good parts. Uh, plus, in those, in those nooks and crannies where the, where the wire forms overlap, getting the powder in those nooks and crannies with Faraday cage effect and whatnot is it can be a big challenge, especially especially with how many joints there are in, yeah. in wire form parts like that. Uh, so for, uh, a, as, you, as you framed it, a, a slam dunk part for, for doing dip coating is absolutely wire forms. There's, there's a lot of other parts that are good candidates as well, but those are it. That's the ideal. Yeah. Well, conversely, um, let's, let's briefly mention some uh, parts that uh, are not good for fluidized bed coating, where it would be a bad application. Yeah, bad applications. I mean, it's, it, it's a it's a form of powder coating that's more versatile than people think. Mm -hmm. But there are some there are absolutely some situations where uh, the bottom line, the part geometry is kind of where it begins and ends in trying to figure out whether or not it will work. And uh, parts that are uh, like sheet metal parts, deep drawn parts or even shallow drawn parts where there's where there's a lot of lips and ledges to the parts I mean, yeah. you can even think of you can even think of a piece of tupperware something that's like a cup or a, a bowl uh when you dip that in uh in a fluidized bed uh, it just it just scoops powder powder accumulates on those ledges and edges and and it, it, it makes it a showstopper uh as far as being able to figure something like that out and, and, and make that work just because the part geometry won't let it. You need, your parts can't act like a baffle to the air and block the air from mixing the powder. Yeah. If that happens, then it, it just, it's just not going to work. Well, the, you, you, as you mentioned, you, you have to displace the air to begin with. So concave parts where the air cannot get out of the way for the powder to be applied uh, is, is problematic. And also the, you have to be able to clear the excess powder that is brought down. If, if there's just ledges and whatever where you cannot clear the excess powder, it's just not, not a good application. Yeah, yeah, totally not feasible. <laughs> So, Mike, you you mentioned the the coating of large parts and getting them done quickly. Um, I've seen uh, you know fifty pounds of powder applied to a park bench in under ten seconds, which uh, is a pretty astonishing fact. Uh, have you encountered any larger dip applications than that? I have. Uh, it's a very cool thing to see. Uh, I, I'm kind of limited in, in what I can express, express about it because uh, the, the confidentiality of my customer's work is always important. But I, I, I've, I've seen a part about the size of a smart car. It was a large casting uh, that was manipulated into a very large tank with the, the largest robot arm that was available on the market at the time. And it, it was a, a really cool thing to see. Um, probably the only way you could do something like that from, from, from what I've seen as well, because with such a large part and it being a casting and having some of those detrimental geometries that we were talking about uh, at, at one point, um, you can really only get a uniform coating on a part as massive as that by having a robot arm that's gonna continuously 
move the part through the powder to make sure that you don't get those bad accumulations and stuff. And, and then especially when it, it's being extracted as well. And, and, uh, and I tell you that the getting a lot of powder on a part quickly uh, is, is one of the fantastic things that the, the dip method does because I mean, compared to compared to any spray technique here, your transfer efficiency is pretty much 100%. Your powder losses from overspray or things of that nature are pretty much zero. Um, and so there's uh, there's a lot of things that have come across my desk, a lot of interesting ideas from folks that want to coat really big stuff um, because the the appeal there of getting a lot of powder on the part quickly is one factor. Uh, but then we, we also have to consider that with electrostatic spray methods, again, when you're putting a lot of powder on with electrostatic spray, there's a limit to that. You get back ionization and the, the powder pops back off the part again, which it's a really cool thing to see when you're in the lab playing around with a Q panel or something and, and you're learning about it. It's neat to see the powder pop off like that. Uh, and play, you know, play scientist and stuff. But when you're trying to do a professional coding line, that is, that's not going to work. Um, so yeah, there's, there's been some really big, really cool parts I've seen get dip coated, um, and, and it's, that's a lot of fun for sure. <laughs>
good, good. Gold, good, good parts. So I come from a background where I mostly used um, airboards, you know, the, the same thing that's yeah. in the bottom yeah. of an electrostatic, uh, you know, uh, feed tank. Uh, do you have some strong opinions on what's the best um, permeable membrane to use? Uh, and it's funny because you've mentioned the airboards before, and that's a product that I've actually never used. Uh, and I, I wouldn't say not to use it uh, because when I when I go through designing tanks or, or looking at other people's systems, it's all about whether or not there's there's that right balance between the airflow and and how the powder is fluidizing. So uh, so yeah, I know that's another good point. That's another that's another definitely good candidate for 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 designing and building these tanks for sure. So Mike, uh, we're both longtime Chicago guys. Um, I guess we got to get past this one point here. Cubs or Sox? Lifelong Cubs fan. Uh, but a couple of years ago, the, the Sox were making it interesting and they were fun to watch for sure. Yeah, no, it's such a 2015 answer. <laughs> um, well, I have friends and family that are afflicted with the same thing. So we'll, we'll just, let's just push on. Now, listen, you've come to the rescue of many fluidized bed dip operations that needed real help. What are some of the common design flaws that you've encountered? Uh, well, uh, we've we've mentioned a bit earlier that the uh, it's important to have the right balance with the airflow and the, the membrane selection. And, and I've often seen the... <clears throat> what I call the abuse of compressed air instead of just the use of compressed air uh, to, to fluidize these tanks. But um, I, to shift the focus to another really important factor, it's the idea that this is a, it should be about a system design. Um, it isn't so much about having a focus on, you know, is the tank right? Because that one piece of equipment in the system is important, but as a powder guy, you know that the most important thing actually is times and temperatures. Um, is the part getting heated before it's being dipped in the right way to the correct temperatures? That's a complicated thing. And are we doing the timing of this process in such a way that we're going to get a good coating and it's going to be repeatable? The and that is a systems approach because the tank full of bubbling powder is only one step in the process of creating a professional coating system. Um, and even if you're in, a, in an electrostatic spray system, the, the times and temperatures that you need are fundamental to being successful with your powder coat operation. So, yes, I look at the focus of you know, what is what does the tank itself do when you're dip coating? But when we're troubleshooting and when we're trying to to iron out defects and, or speed things up or 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 anything of that nature, the systems approach. How are we loading the conveyor? Are the are the hangers correct? Are we are we is the airflow in the oven right? Are we to making measurements to see what kind of time and temperatures we're getting to? Are we making measurement based decisions in working out these defects or are we just kind of guessing and, and uh, just taking stabs at things um a, a systems level approach when it comes to the troubleshooting that you're mentioning is is always my my number one tool okay let me let me drill down on just one thing um and, and it does have to do directly with with the fluid bed itself um but it's one of the more uh common ones that you see so when you come into somebody's uh operation and you see the violent eruptions of powder exploding up in very in in only a certain sections of of the fluid bed and going all over the floor and into the plant and causing um, industrial hygiene issues galore um, how do you generally end up addressing those bottom line we make a new tank um, there's always a step before that I take some measurements uh, we run the calculations we 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 look at that tank and we ask ourselves whether or not it's been whether or not it's been designed correctly and whether or not it's it's being operated correctly if we can if we can make some adjustments to the to the tank that we have then of course that's a much more reasonable approach mm -hmm. but uh, a lot of the time the the tank has problems and has had problems and i'm not the first person to get there and so the troubleshooting that's been applied to that tank 
has had some extra modifications that get in the way more than they help. Uh, so we definitely think about all those steps along the way. So anywhere from making modifications to replacing the tank, because ultimately uh, it's just a tank. Uh, the rest of the system, the oven, the conveyor, everything else, that's, uh, that's a totally different story. But for these violently erupting tanks that are just going haywire, sometimes we just need to change the membrane. Sometimes we need to change the blower or the fan. Uh, sometimes we need to change the tank. It, it, it all depends. But there's, uh, uh, there's a lot of options. It's, it's, it's not always gloom and doom. These things are, uh, that, that individual problem of the, the lava erupting in, in the tank is, is, is one that's very, very fixable for sure. Well, listen, Mike, I want to thank you for coming on and doing this uh, video. I hope uh, people find it helpful and enlightening. I know um, I, I found it very helpful. So um, thank you. Well, Tim, thanks for having me. I, I really enjoy this conversation and this is a topic I'm really passionate about. Thanks for having me. Betcha. Thank you.